to the cloud. So I'm going to go ahead and, and kick us off. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Candice Patiki, and I'm the BC and Yukon Program Director for Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative. And uh, Nadine Reynolds, who has the, who is, uh, well, I don't know, she's up in the high left corner for me. She, Nadine Reynolds is our Upper Columbia Program Manager. And, um, and Tim Burkhart in the, in the red and black plaid there is our Manager of Strategic Engagement and the Peace. And we'll, we'll introduce our guests in a minute. Um, I just wanted to note that this session is being recorded and it will be posted to our website. And uh, to note that um, both Nadine and I, uh, I'm in Nelson and Nadine is in Silverton. So the combined is the traditional terry of the Tanaha, the Shwetmik, the Sinaixt, and the Silks Okanagan peoples. And Tim is on the unceded lands of the Kwonkan-speaking peoples of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations and the Wasonic people. And our presenters, including former Chief Ken Cameron, are in Soto territory in Treaty 8. So uh, really great to have so many folks here. We've had tremendous interest in this webinar, which is great. Um, and it's always, you know, this is the fourth in the ethical space series, and we're seeing a lot of different sectors represented. So that's really gratifying as well. Um, you know, government of all levels, indigenous folks, tourism operators and guides, NGOs, also culture workers and academics and researchers. And so it's, it's just really great um, to see everybody. Just a little bit of Zoom etiquette for today is um, please keep yourself muted, except um, during the uh, during the Q and A, and there will be and and do keep your cameras on during the Q and A. Obviously during the presentations, you know as you like, but uh, but it is nice to be able to see some faces, even though everybody can only really kind of see the first screen. Um, it's it's nice to feel part of a community, um, and there will be two Q and A sessions and. Uh, we'll see how that goes in terms of moderation. We might we, we, we might take questions through the chat or we might just open it up. Uh, and again, we'll just see how that goes. Um, but do take a minute um, now or in the next few minutes to, uh, to go ahead and, and introduce yourself in the chat. Um, if you feel comfortable with that, just your name and, and uh, maybe where you work or uh, where you're from. Um, it's always interesting to hear about people's interest in indigenous led conservation and that's really what this series is all about. Um, so as I mentioned, this is our fourth ethical space uh, webinar and the recordings of the first three are on our website. And we will um, put a link in the chat there. I think it's just y2y.net slash ethical space. Um, and really the objectives of these sessions are um, to provide a learning experience for non-Indigenous people about Indigenous authority uh, in support of uh, Indigenous-led conservation to help relationship building among us all and set us up to more effectively work together um, in support of indigenous led conservation. So our outcomes really are um, looking to deepen understanding of indigenous frameworks and, and reconciliation concepts and, in a, and uh, conservation in action. We're gonna hear some really um, great stuff today about that and um, provide a sense of a network of peers that are, that are engaging on, on all of this and inspire inspire people and empower you and, and support you in taking um, whatever your next steps are, either individually and or in your organizations. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Tim Burkhart now, and he's going to introduce our presenters for today. Thank you, Candice. Just going to share my screen here. Awesome. Well, we are so excited to hear these voices today. Um, this is an incredible story, uh, the, the story of the Caribou Partnership Agreement uh, protecting the Sacred Twin Sisters area. This is a, a story of hope. Um, one uh, hope is, is, is hard to come by in conservation at times, especially when dealing with species at risk, but uh, this really is a, an incredible story of hope. So we're really grateful to be joined by leaders from Soto First Nations, and I'm, I'm very honored to introduce them today. 
Um, first up will be uh, Councillor Ken Cameron. Uh, Ken is a councillor with Soto First Nations and was the chief during negotiations of the partnership agreement. Ken has had a wide and varied history. Um, in addition to being a great leader and storyteller, he's been a horse wrangler, a deep sea fisherman, uh, a pipeline and industrial worker. He's an award-winning artist and carver, and perhaps most famous for playing bass in a rock band called Tribe. We'll also be joined today by a Naomi Owens Beak. Uh, uh, Naomi is a proud Cree, Deniza, and Canadian woman from Soto First Nations and is the honored mother of Spencer Ron Beak. She received her diploma from the Nicola Valley Institute in Natural Resources and has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Victoria. Uh, Naomi is a re registered professional biologist and is currently the Treaty Rights and Environmental Protection Director for Soto First Nations. In addition to that, she wears many other hats. She sits on the board of directors of the Twin Sisters Native Plants Nursery. She's a society director for the Nakanasawachi Stewardship Society, which recovers caribou in Treaty 8 territory, and is a board member for the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. And finally, we have James Hickling. Uh, James is a lawyer based in Vancouver. Uh, he's been working with Soda First Nations for more than a decade um, and has, was very involved in putting together the partnership agreement as a lead negotiator for Soto First Nations. And so to set the context today, we're taking a journey to uh, beautiful Northeastern British Columbia in Treaty 8 territory. Uh, the Peace Region is a vast, wild and diverse landscape where the Boreal Plains meet the Northern Rockies. It's known as an oasis for wildlife, for people who love the land, and it's also a resource development powerhouse for British Columbia. In the piece, the cumulative impacts of industry are manifold. Um, oil and gas activity cuts up the boreal into little fragments, along with coal mining, forestry, wind farming, and mega projects, hydro projects like the WAC Bennett Dam, pictured here, and the Site C Dam. And together, these cumulative impacts are pushing some species to the brink. Roads and other linear disturbances fragment to habitat to cumulatively impact that region beyond landscape resilience for wide ranging species like caribou navigating a landscape like this is extremely difficult. And you know we have some great map mapping and modeling done. This is an unbuffered human footprint map of the piece recently done. It shows a sea of development and settlement, um, but it also shows an intact bridge across that sea through the, uh, the area of the partnership agreement up to the Musqueca Chica. So while uh, Canada has committed to protecting 25% of its lands and waters by 2025, the northeast of BC has seen relatively little protection um, over the last uh, decades. Only 4.2% of the region is protected in parks and protected area, and there's been no new protection in 20 years until the partnership agreement. For caribou, a once abundant species remembered as being like a sea or like bugs on the land, they're facing extinction across British Columbia. Um, so uh, Populations are declining at around 10% per year, and we've lost three herds in the last few years alone, burnt pine, self selkirks, self purcells, while some herds have less than 25 animals. So I'm really excited to hear this story, to pass this over to Ken and James now, to hear how Soto and West Moberly have reversed this trend and uh, for caribou in their territory. So please join me in welcoming Councillor Ken Cameron. Thank you, Tim, and uh, welcome everyone. For joining us here today. I'm going to start off with just a short prayer in my Cree language. All my relations, thank you. So I guess I'm going to, I'm going to start with our story of, of the Soto people and how we got here and the journey that began somewhere in Manitoba in, in the late 1800s. Our people, our Soto people were living, our, they were confined to a reservation actually, and they were having a hard time. They were suffering from hunger, sickness, all the things that, you know, being confined to reservation meant in those days. So our spiritual leader at the time, his name was Kakagu Wakonis. And he, he went out and he, he did a, a fast a vision quest and a, a ceremony to ask for help from our creator. He went out with his pipe and he prayed for four days and four nights. And his answer on the fourth night was given to him in the form of, of a vision of these, these twin mountains that were in the, at the end of this beautiful pristine lake. And he was told, go to those mountains to the west and, and 
when you get to those mountains, to those sacred mountains, you will get protection and those mountains are sacred and they will protect you and they'll give you, uh, for, for time immemorial, they will, they will protect you people. So he, when he came back, he told his people what he was given, this vision that he was given. And he, he was told how it was gonna be so difficult. It was gonna be a tough journey to go to these mountains. So, you know, he, I guess what, what he did was he, he told the people that I am going to leave. I am going to have to go to these mountains and whoever wants to come with me can come with me because although it's going to be a, a really tough journey, I'm still going to go. I'm going to leave in a couple of days. So he told some of his young people to go out and to slaughter a couple of cattle that were nearby and, and some of the, uh, the farmers, the European farmers that were close by. Um, he told them go out and, and slaughter a couple of cattle and we're gonna have a, a feast, a going away feast. So they did that and they, they brought all the, the food back and they, they had a going away feast. And then when he was leaving, he said, tell them that, that I went and slaughtered these cattle, that I did it and I, and I took off and I'm, I'm running away. So that way these people will leave you alone because a lot of our, our, our Soto people stayed behind because the journey was gonna to be too tough. And you know, there was a lot of different reasons why they didn't come. So they took off and uh, they started journeying to the West. And then when they, I remember them saying when they first got to the, the, the Rocky Mountains, it was West of Calgary somewhere and it was in the Stony Indians territory. And the Stonies welcomed them that winter and they stayed there. And there's actually, a, they, they had been staying with a different tribe every winter. They were, they were hidden because all Indian people off, off of reservations at that time, uh, in those turbulent times, they were considered to be hostile. If you weren't on a reservation, you were like, considered hostile Indians back in those days. So I guess once they stayed at, um, at Stony uh, Reservation for a winter, they started heading north and then they, they started heading up towards towards our mountains here where, where the, we live now today. So, um, because it's always been known that, that these mountains were, were strong spiritual uh, place to be with, with a lot of protection and sacredness. So, and, and not only the Soto, but all the tribes probably in Western Canada knew that these mountains were sacred. So they, that was a, a well-known fact in Indian country. So, because of that reason, we've always known of this, this powerful, powerful connection with, with the spiritual area, these mountains and then this lake and, and the connection now today is, is that we're protecting the last of the Quinsies are heard in, in the very foothills of these mountains. So it's a pretty powerful thing. So anyways, back in the 1990s, Amico a uh, corporation was given a uh, permit by the BC government to, to drill at the base of these mountains. And everyone that, that was in the traditional beliefs said, they can't do this, we have to stop them. So we immediately uh, formed a blockade. And uh, you know, all, all the elders from both West Moberly and Soto came, in, came and supported us at this blockade. And so, and also a lot of people from, from as far away as South Dakota, Southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, they came to support us also at, at, this, uh, at this blockade. And, and as, as a result of these people supporting us, we, we, they brought back the Sundance ceremony, which hadn't been seen here for a long time. And I always remember that when, when, the, when the Sundance was starting the very first time, the opening song and all the elders were, were moved, they were, you know, tears of joy. And they said, we haven't seen this for so long. It's just such an incredible thing to sing, to see, to, to bring it back to our, to our nation here. So it was a powerful thing. And, uh, you know, we, we were all there for about probably 14 days. The blockade was, was, you know, we weren't, nobody came through there. We just, we just performed the Sundance and and, it, and by the time the, the camp was, was being taken down and, and we were moving away. And I remember the Sundance keeper who was from South Dakota, a medicine man. He said, look, remember you people, we haven't done this for nothing. We've asked for a higher power for their help through the Sundance ceremony. And so just remember, even though if 
they go back there, which Amico did, by the way, they, they went through and they went and drilled there, which was going to be the, the biggest find uh, uh, ever in the Northeast, they said. So the, the Sundance keeper said, remember that, that help that we asked for, said it wasn't for nothing. And as it turned out, this drilling program, they, they drilled and drilled and drilled, and they even went deeper than they were supposed to be going, and, and it turned out to be a duster. So that was pretty awesome, <laughs> the way it turned out. So we were, we were all pretty happy about that because I always remember being, being a young kid in these Twin Sister Mountains. We used to camp out there every summer with my dad and some other people. And, and I remember being, I was a, a horse wrangler and a camp attendant. I, I would watch huge herds of caribou, you know, coming from mountain to mountain with just uh, like a whole bunch of them, like a hundred or more or whatever. I didn't really count them, but I know there was some large, large herds of, of caribou. And there were sheep, there were goats, there were all these animals were up there, which they are not anymore. But so, and also I remember another time too, when we were young kids in Moberly Lake School, a bunch of us kids saw this herd of animals swimming across Moberly Lake. And uh, we explained to the elders, you know, we weren't sure what we saw, but we saw these animals with horns and swimming across the lake. And when we described them, they said, oh, those were caribou. Um, that's what you saw there. The caribou were coming, were going from, from range to range, and they were crossing the, the lake and they swam across. So I guess this is a, just a good example of, of some of our traditional stories because there's always, you know, these, they don't seem to have a beginning and they never have an ending either because we know that these mountains are going to be sacred like forever and ever, the time immemorial for the future generations and the generations that are yet to come. They will always be sacred, and we know that. Oh, thank you, everybody. Can I ask them? No, thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, beautiful. And we will have, uh, we're going to hear from Naomi now, and then we'll have uh, the first of two uh, question and answers. So if you have questions for Ken um, about the story or anything at all, just uh, just hang on to that and uh, and we're going to hear from Naomi. Um, All right. Now. Go for it, Naomi. Thanks, Ken. I'll share my screen. Sorry. Did that work? We're not, we're you not. You can see it. Though. You need to go into slideshow mode. Yeah, oh, okay, you can see it. Okay, I wasn't sure. All right. Can say Nasika Sun, Naomi Owens B, Go Chinyam Overly Lake. As Tim mentioned, I am the Treaty Rights and Environmental Protection Director for Soto First Nations. Uh, this is a map of our Treaty 8 territory. Um, Soda First Nations was an adhesion to this treaty in 1914. Hey, we Naomi. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but we're not seeing your slide. If you want to click to the second one and then... Oh, sorry, um, sorry. I think I know what happened. There's screens all over. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Is that working? That's perfect. Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> oh, wait. No, because uh, we're seeing your notes. <laughs> that's right. Hey, oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. We did a dry run too. I know what I'll do. I know what I did. Oh my God. You should be able to select which monitor you want to share from. Yeah, they're all, I have three screens and they're all numbered. So <laughs> it's, it's my bad. How about that? There we go. Are you sure? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> huh, okay. 
thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so here's Treaty 8. We have the right to practice our culture, spirituality, partake in seasonal rounds of hunting, fishing, trapping, harvesting, and camping for as long as the sun shines, river flows, and the grass grows. That being said, we also have the right to protect a species as we see necessary. We are a sustainable nation. Now where am I going here? No, I can't switch slides. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh, okay. Okay, so the BC scientists have defined seven herds within the central and southern mountain caribou herds. There's the Graham, the Moberly, the Kennedy Siding, Bird Pine, Scott, Quintet, and Narraway. Um, so through traditional knowledge, we have indicated that the habitat area is much broader than what the current scientific estimates are for the range. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, some caribou population graphs that have been declining since the mid nineties. This graph I have up here is the quintet. So quintet was considered to be one of the most stable populations in the mid nineties. And since then they have dropped down to about 50 or so. And this was uh, documented in 2017. The Narraway herd, which it crosses the Alberta and BC border, is uh, about at 23 right now. This is the burnt pine herd, which sadly is now extirpated. And here's a graph of the Quinze saw in red. And in 2013, it hit a record low of, of 13. So this is kind of what triggered our efforts uh, so I'd like to speak now about the efforts that West Moberly First Nations and Soto First Nations have invested toward the recovery of caribou. Bit of a backgrounder, in 2012 and 2013, SFN hosted a caribou forum, or a few caribou forums, where, where Treaty 8 nations and all levels of government were invited, biologists and industry. Uh, from these collaborative workshops, critical actions were identified and the Peace Northern Caribou Com Committee was created. So three direct actions were identified with uh, the help of First Nations traditional knowledge. Uh, the three action items were uh, to build a caribou maternal pen, uh, predator management and habitat restoration. Basically, we had enough with all the research. We knew that caribou were declining. Uh, we knew we had to take action. So I just wanted to note the date and time of these tweets from the the Mining Association of BC. Um, so we've been working on this for quite a while, 10 years so, so far. I'll let you read through those. So with the direction from our elders and the community and all those involved within the Peace Northern Caribou Committee, um, we, we had recover, a recovery action plan in place. So we had a five-year plan that was developed by Dr. Scott McNay, together with the Soto First Nations and West Moberly First Nations. The goal was to reach uh, a sustainable population of a thousand caribou. So eventually we, don't, we wouldn't require a maternal pen um, to identify, protect and restore critical habitat increase caribou survival within the maternal pen and reduce caribou mortality with translocation and predator management. So in 2013, the, uh, the Peace Northern Caribou Committee decided to go ahead with the construction of a maternal pen. Uh, their permits had to be quickly sorted out with the province. There was some concern with us translocating caribou to our our pen site or our location. And um, basically the concern was that we wanted to translocate caribou cows from the Graham herd to the Moberly herd. And they didn't agree with that because of genetic mixing between the caribou. So we decided to translocate from the Scott herd to the Moberly herd, which basically now is the Klinze Zaw herd. 
Uh, so once there was once the agreement was reached on all the, those concerns, the permit was granted. Construction of of the pen began, and ground and air crews were established to kick off caribou capture. So as Councillor Ken explained, the twin sisters are are sacred. The Quinzeza live among these sacred mountains. And this, knowing this created a greater urgency for us to protect this dwindling population in our backyard. When not rushed by permit deadlines, we, we start off with uh, picking lichen. Um, we start picking lichen throughout the summer and fall. And with lichen collection, we have invited the Moberly Lake Elementary School um, our Soto First Nation staff, the local fire departments. Where we pick lichen is based on the traditional knowledge of our elders. Uh, we do not harvest, we do not over harvest the picking of lichen and we always rotate where our collections are occurring. Um, once the lichen is picked, we store it in our uh, Twin Sisters Native Plants nursery for storage. Here's a close up of the lichen we pick. It's a reindeer lichen called a uh, Cladonia rangiferina. Sorry if I mispronounced that. So here's a picture of the Mobile Lake school children assisting with us, some cheap labor. Just kidding. So the caribou, they're very picky. They, uh, they'll only eat a specific lichen, which is the reindeer lichen. So before each outing, we do some hands-on training, training with whoever has come out to pick and um, just so we know the correct lichen is being picked for the, the caribou. Here's some community members picking and those red bags that you see here, um, we pick about 400 bags of those every year. So we have two pen sites. Uh, we have one located at, on Bickford Mountain and the other on Rochford Mountain. Um, we have had issues with permit appro approvals. So uh, the pen site like this one in 2013, they had to build through some pretty extreme winter conditions. So digging in like six, eight feet of snow. We also have to install a 14 foot black geotextile cloth that uh, spans the perimeter of the pen site. Uh, once the cloth is up, the pen maintenance, then the people who are doing pen maintenance install an electric fence, probably like a meter or two in front of the geotextile cloth. And we are in our ninth year right now. And as we, as I speak, we have a maintenance crew out up on Rochford Pen and doing pen maintenance on the geotextile right now and installing the electric fence. So once the pen is up, the guardian cabins were constructed. And we now we just ensure the proper maintenance and upkeep of these cabins. Uh, we also build watchtowers for the guardians to do daily observations of the caribou. Uh, we also, in pre-COVID times, we've, we've done tours and taken people up into the watchtowers. So this is an aerial view of the Bickford pen. This is also a diagram of our staging areas for the caribou capture. So every new year, we start preparing for the long awaited caribou capture, which usually occurs in early or mid March. Um, we use two helicopters for this operation. One is used to net gun and tranquilize the caribou and the other is used to transport the sedated caribou to the staging area. This is one of our community guard, our, one of our caribou guardians from Soto. We have a designated drop off area from the pen site so the helicopter does not disturb the caribou that are already captured and in the pen. Uh, the caribou are transported in a skimmer behind a snowmobile with a handler to the pen site. I've had the lucky opportunity of participating in this transport. So at the pen site, the caribou is processed by vets where they take hair, blood, scat samples, and the teeth are examined. A collar is put on the cow with a distinct ID number. The cow is weighed, and we have to make sure when handling the caribou that her airway is clear because 
because she is sedated and we don't want her to have a constructed airway. So once the cow is processed, the vet injects a, res a reversal um, drug into the caribou cow. And everyone just takes a step back while she wakes up to get her bearings and realize she's now in a pen. So we've had a good crew of vets, biologists, the guardians assisting over the past nine years. This year, the crew size will be reduced drastically due to COVID. Here's a picture of uh, the West Moberly Caribou Guardians and we're just happy, committed people. Once the caribou are captured, it's now time for the caribou guardians to begin their 24 hour, seven days a week watch. Um, so SFN, West Moberly First Nations and Soto First Nations each hire their own members to alternate shifts. So West Moberly will do a one week shift and we'll, we switch off every Monday. And we, there should be two people out there at all times. Um, this is definitely a special breed of people who can commit to this type of work. It's hard work. The guardians have daily tasks. This is uh, one of the guardians feeding the, the caribou at one of the troughs, feeding troughs, and they're fed twice a day. A may or so is when the cows start to have their calves. The guardians assist a biologist and take samples similar to that of the cow. Uh, the calves are fitted with a special collar that drops when their neck reaches a certain size. And the calves are just so adorable. So here's a picture of life in the pen. Uh, here's an aerial view of the Rochford pen. In the background, you can see a battleship mount mountain in the background. Just a beautiful territory. So we must ensure that uh, pen sites have access to water. We've been very fortunate with both of the pen sites we've constructed so far that they both had uh, water for the caribou cows once the snow melts. This is a view from the watchtower. So guardians take daily observations from the watchtower. They just look at the basic general health. Um, if there's any abnormalities, we have to address it and make sure that everything, they just have to make sure that the cows are doing okay and make note of it daily. This is the Rochford pen uh, caribou cabin, or sorry, guardian cabin. That's it. It's equipped with a satellite phone, a radio, first aid kit. Uh, there's sleeping and cooking quarters in there. Here's a picture of a mom and calf. Uh, each guardian group figures out how to best identify the cows that they're now, uh, you know, living with. <laughs> uh, so I think the SFN crew, they, they go by colored ear tags. So, oh, that's uh, purple, yellow, or yellow, orange, whatever. And I believe West Mobile really goes by the ID number. Um, so here's the cows and calves feeding at the trough. Um, I just, I must note that the caribou are given a diet of 100% lichen when they first enter the pen. The garden, guardians slowly transition the cows to a pellet mix. The pellets are, are used on reindeer farms. So they're full of the necessary nutrients that the caribou require throughout the summer spring and summer. Here, here the guardians are just carrying the troughs to drier ground. The calf eating. The whole point of this program is to safeguard the calves and cows from predation. When the ecosystem is off balance, where there's habitat loss and fragmentation and increase in predators, it, it made sense to us 10 years ago to build a pen for this very reason. So far, it has protected and increased the Klinzai Zaw herd, which we consider to be a success story, success story. I just thought this was a beautiful picture. Over the years, we have learned what works and what doesn't work. Um, so keep the understory at a natural state. Be very diligent during calving. Create many feeding stations, a later release, healthier, more mature calves. They're they can run away from predators more easily. 
extend guardians past release date. Um, so in the past, we had a fairly aggressive, uh, our very first year, it was all new to us. It was all experimental and we didn't really know what we were doing. So the first year we had like this ceremony where we invited our elders to let the uh, release the caribou and it kind of just frightened everybody. So years to like since then we've just done a passive release we just open a portion of the geotextile gate and just let them leave at their leisure so oh yeah more lessons are reduce vehicle traffic importance of site uh, of water as i mentioned before and the importance of a continued wolf removal so habitat restoration this is the this is what i believe to be the most important action item uh, so we have done, we've completed an assessment of habitat and reclamation opportunities. We have ongoing planning proposals, permits and grant applications. We've coordinated with the pulse petting approach and that means we've alternate, we alternate between two pen sites. Our first restoration site was an oil and gas road that led to the Alpine. It was about two and a half kilometers long. Uh, we, where we recontoured and planted the road with native plants. Restoring these old logging and oil and gas roads is criti in critical habitat is key to the caribou. It reduces predation, line of sight and access. It also reduces human activities such as snowmobiling and ATVing, which can be disruptive to the sensitive caribou. We're planting native plants and hope that it'll bring back the natural state of what it was prior to development. So I'd like to bring you back to this graph. With our efforts this far, the, the Klinzeza population is increasing. As of 2020, I believe our numbers for the Klinzeza herd was uh, around 80 to 90. And we are grateful for what West Moberly and Soto First Nations have achieved to make this project a success. To conclude, we could not have done this without the support of our sponsors which makes this a shared success with our partners. We also now have the Intergovernmental Caribou Partnership Agreement, which our lawyer will be sharing with you. This agreement further adds to the protection and recovery of the caribou. Caribou in my language is pronounced atik. And so we are now benefiting all atik. Masi. Masi Naomi. So thank you so much for that um, <clears throat> to, to both <clears throat> Ken Cameron and Naomi Owens Beek for those lovely pr um, presentations. And um, we will take questions now. I first just want to take a second to recognize, uh, I think there's a protocol here. You meant to recognize elected officials. And so I'm just uh, saying hi to Mayor Ange Kaliza from Fernie. Um, so we have one question that came in the chat so far, and that would be um, Carla, who's asking about the causes of the caribou decline. Well, Can the first major cause was the, the, the Bennett Dam. And I was, I was there as a young person uh, when I talked about all these huge herds that I saw um, before the dam was flooded in the time when, when we were camping up there and there was no dam which would have been in the early 60s, I guess. Uh, there was hundreds and hundreds of, of, of caribou roaming around and, you know, going from valley to valley, mountain to mountain, and, uh, you know, not hindered by, by this huge lake. So that was a big, uh, big reason right off the bat. And then you had for, uh, later years of, uh, you know, development, resource development and all that other stuff. So they had a hard time. Thank you. Hmm. Naomi, anything to add? Here? Yeah, definitely. Habitat loss was definitely one of the first impacts um, for the caribou, or sorry, the, the building of the, the dam. So yeah, major habitat loss and fragmentation. Thank you. Um, a, a, a quick question. I had this question too. How big are the pens? I, I, it's a bit, I did get to go and see the pen and it was bigger than I thought. So how, how big are yeah. those? Yeah, so the first pen I think was eight or nine hectares. And I, I believe now they're around 15 hectares. Okay. 
Um, and a question from Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Do you plan to provide the same support, support to other herds now that you have proven success of the process? I think that's the idea with this agreement, this partnership agreement. Okay. And, um, and Adrian is asking about restoration. What's on the horizon for more restoration work? Pretty much within where the boundary where the Klinzeza herd is, there's a lot of work on reclaiming and restoring oil and gas and logging roads. So we're starting with that. There's just the spaghetti of roads within the range. Which we're actually working with, we're working with CAN4 on one of the sites. Okay. And um, which kind of follows to a question from Justin, who's sort of asking, well, why aren't the companies, <laughs> why don't the companies restore their own roads? Um, exactly. And that's, that's exactly, that's, that's what we want. <laughs> that's our question, too. <laughs> I won't put any, uh, any, any of our friends from the provincial government on the spot here. Um, <laughs> we have a question from, I, I hope I pronounced this right, Loyer. Um, the purpose of the geotextile curtain, why, why so high and why so, um, yeah, why, why, why that in particular? To keep them fenced in and to keep the predators out. Um, we had one year where the snow load was so high that the cows uh, would just climb up on the snow and jump over the geotextile. So it, that's why the geotextile is so high. And what's the point if they're getting out of the pen, they're not protected. And also, um, Naomi, I was, I was told by, by one of the elders that um, the, the eye contact or the, the lack of eye contact was very important for the, the pregnant females in the, uh, in the pen because they um, went into that um, survival mode kind of, Thing when they were being stared at. I don't know if that's, I think that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. We try to keep our distance for sure. Like, well, that's why the watchtower is there. We don't want to be invading yeah. their space. Mm -hmm. And when they have calves, the, the caribou guardians are, and the biologists are as quick as possible because they don't want the mom to uh, abandon her calf. So they have to not stay very long with the calf. They have to be as quick as they can. Exactly. We have a question from Peter who asks about um, reclaiming access roads to well sites. And he's wondering, uh, was Amoco required back in the 1990 to reclaim their road? Yeah, I don't think uh, they ever did, eh, okay? Well, they did uh, slope it back into, into a non-accessible uh, condition, especially further up, like past our uh, with the, the cabin we were talking about up to Johnson Creek. Once you get past there and it goes up into the slopes, I noticed that they they put it back to bed is the word. So so partially it was done. Thank you. Naya asks, um, was there any conflict or difficulty getting people on board with the pens? Were there people who didn't like the idea of penning the caribou? It was such a dire situation. It was either like, okay, we watch the caribou die or, or we try to do something. And so I think the community felt it was our obligation to assist if we could. Otherwise, I, the Klinzeza was heading the same direction as the burnt pine. They would have been extirpated. Yeah. Um. Which I think sort of goes to the next question here as well. Carmen asks, have you found um, any implications with the, with the invasive sort of scientific techniques, um, you know, extreme intervention as a result of mistreatment of habitat? Maybe you just already answered that, but. Well, like I said, we want to reach a thousand. So the pen site is a temporary fix. It's not a long-term situation. It's, it's, it's something to get us to a sustainable herd. Right. Um, what about predation of calves? How does that, how, what's been that experience when, when you do the releases? 
Sorry, I, sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, for sure. Erica is asking, do you see much predation of calves at the beginning of the, of the calf cow releases? Oh yeah, there's, there's mortalities every year. Um, some, some are due to predation, some are due to an avalanche. So it's really, it depends. Um, but, but the calves are, when we release them, they're strong enough to run beside their mother. So, um, there, but there's always a predation scare for sure. Yeah. Great. Um, Monica is asking, are the wolves relocated? Um, or does, does the necessary initial protection of the herd make them more vulnerable later? Not sure if you mean the wolves or the caribou in terms of the vulnerability there, Monica. Do you want to unmute and just clarify? The, the caribou just because they've been so protected and all of a sudden, boom, you know, they're dealing right. with the predators again. Predator. Okay. okay, so what's the question? Are the wolves relocated is the first part of the question. Okay. And then does, does initially protecting the herd make them more vulnerable later? The idea being that maybe they haven't built up skills. Right. Well, no, caribou are very, they have strong instincts. Um, they, we do not relocate the wolves. No, there is a, we have a wolf trapping program. So we use the fur or whatever we, whatever. It's, they're not relocated. Sorry to say. But that is our treaty, right? <laughs> Question from uh, uh, Ken Boone. Hi, Ken. Are there plans to do similar recovery, similar recovery programs with the other declining herds? You might've had a similar question already. I think there are. I think, yeah, I think that is a discussion. Great. Um, uh, from Caitlin, she's asking, uh, she's saying thank you, and she has visited the pen. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, the Guardians expressed that it was taking a long time to get permits to do the road restoration. And uh, is that still a problem or is that getting easier? I think, I think that may be a James question, but I think there was some discussion on asking BC to progress the permit, I don't know, application process, because there were, yeah, we have faced a lot of permit issues where we have to wait and wait, and then we wait too long and we basically can't go ahead with some projects. So I think working with BC, I think that has been addressed. I'm not too sure. Did you have anything to add, James? Uh, no, Candace. I'm. I think Naomi caught it. Thanks. Okay. okay good. Um, question from Jamie asking. He's saying thanks for all of this. And what are the lessons learned for other species reintroduction efforts? I think it's just the beginning. This is a program that's going to be copied. I think it has to be, uh, and a lot of other other people have actually, you know, there's a lot of interest in the, in this program because, you know, guess what? It's working, even though it's in the, like Naomi said, it's in a small way, but it is working, and so there are other people interested in in you know asking us for, for help. I mean, we've offered to, to help other people too. So yeah, it's a good thing, good thing. We certainly think so. Um, okay. Um, we already had a question from Naya, so I'm gonna to go to somebody else. Uh, Dwayne is asking, have you ever had a wolf jump the fence? No. That's the job of the caribou guardians. Um, so there is like 24 hour surveillance and you know, we have, we've never had a predator get into the pen site. We did have the cow escape once. <laughs> well, on that note, um, do you see change in behavior um, in animals that have been you know, in the pen and then released? I guess as against um, animals that haven't been. I think there's been a cow that has been recaptured more than once. And um, 
I wouldn't say there is a change in her behavior, but she's kind of familiar with what the pen is. Maybe it's like a spa to her. I don't know. I think she knows it's, I think she knows it's a safe place. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop questions for this portion. There will be another opportunity to ask questions of all three of our presenters. But at this point, we're going to move to the presentation from James Hickling. Uh, so whenever you're ready, James, thank you. Thanks, Candace. Can you see my opening slide? Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, we're really lucky to hear from Ken and Naomi. It's a, a rare opportunity. It's great to hear uh, from the people who are who are achieving these goals. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about the legal and political context. Um, I have a number of slides, and I'm going to move through them quickly. So uh, I'd be grateful if you stayed with me. Some of them are a bit difficult. Um, but I promise there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's a bit of relief at the end and, um, and we'll end on a positive note. So uh, there are, I think of there being three elements to the legal framework here. The first is treaty number eight. And uh, the treaty imposes a positive legal duty on the crown to protect traditional indigenous resources. And the second element is the Constitution Act 1982, and that ensures that treaty rights and the Crown's obligations are part of the supreme law of Canada. And I'll explain that a bit uh, further in a second. And then the third um, piece of the framework is the Species at Risk Act. And it authorizes Canada to enter into agreements to enhance the survival of endangered wildlife. So if we just dig into this a little bit deeper, during the making of Treaty 8, this is the report of Clifford Sifton, who was the superintendent of Indian Affairs at the time. And he's writing to uh, his report to Ottawa. And he says, our chief difficulty was the apprehension that the hunting and fishing privileges were to be curtailed. And he went on to say, we had to solemnly assure them that only such laws as were in the interests of the Indians and that were found necessary to protect the animals would be made and that they would be as free to hunt and fish after the treaty as they would be if they never entered into it. And so this is one of the sources uh, of the positive obligation on the Crown to protect the resources that First Nations people rely on. And then we have the Constitution Act, Section 35. Uh, I think most people are familiar with this by now, but this is the clause in the Constitution that uh, recognizes and affirms the Aboriginal and treaty rights of Indigenous people. There's another clause that people don't uh, refer to very often, which is 52, which explains that the Constitution is the supreme law of Canada. So uh, treaty rights and Aboriginal rights, similar to charter rights, have a higher status than ordinary laws made by Parliament and provincial legislatures. That's why they are um, part of the highest level of law in Canada. And then Section 11 of the Conservation Act authorizes the minister to enter into conservation agreements. So taken together, these three uh, pieces of the framework form a, a powerful um, set of tools to advance uh, conservation goals and in particular the protection of endangered species. And what it resulted in is this agreement uh, 
between Canada, BC, Soto, and West Moberly. It's a first of its kind intergovernmental agreement. It applies to the central group of the Southern Mountain Caribou. It recognizes the leadership that the First Nations have shown in caribou recovery. And it protects about 2 million acres of caribou habitat through new parks and protected areas. I think the easiest way to understand the land protection measures is uh, this summary map. So the dark green, solid green polygons are existing parks. The cross-hatched green area is a new uh, Class A provincial park. The blue areas are high elevation caribou habitat, which are uh, subject to a moratorium on industrial activities. So no mining, no logging, no wind farms. And the yellow shaded areas are areas where industrial activities can take place, but they need to meet a higher standard of uh, uh, mitigation and offsetting measures to um, protect caribou. When you add all these things together, the new uh, park and protected areas, it's a pretty significant contribution to uh, conservation in BC. It's one of the top three um, park and protected areas uh, in the province. There are some other commitments in the agreements. There's uh, ongoing support for the maternal pen and for indigenous guardians. It establishes a caribou recovery committee of BC, Canada, Soto and West Moberly uh, to review uh, permit applications. It establishes new land use objectives for matrix habitat. Matrix habitat is the uh, habitat between the um, pieces of core habitat. Those are basically new rules for how um, forestry can take place and new rules about road reclamation and uh, other types of uh, mitigative measures that are needed to protect caribou habitat. There, are, there will be three new regional plans um, for habitat restoration, mitigation and offsetting, and motorized vehicle access management, consistent with similar plans in BC. And then ongoing predator management um, until habitat conditions no longer require it. And, you know, that we're talking about wolf cull. Unfortunately, it's one of the measures that's uh, needed to maintain the populations. So I'll, uh, in terms of the political context, I'll just uh, lay out the timeline to, to the agreement so you can see the uh, ups and downs of the process. Um, as Naomi and Ken described, there's been uh, decades of work to protect the area and uh, specifically caribou since 2012. The program was so successful that in 2017, BC and Canada approached Soto and Westmo to talk about a partnership agreement. There were some uh, early bumps in the road, uh, but by March of 2018, we had a first draft completed with uh, input from a variety of experts. In April of that year, BC withdrew from the discussions. The Assistant Deputy Minister said there was no mandate to proceed. That was a bit of a roadblock, um, but in May, the Federal Minister of Environment found that there was an imminent threat to caribou recovery, uh, making that funding under the Species at Risk Act. And this is important because under Section 80, 
of the Species at Risk Act, the federal cabinet can make a emergency order for the protection of an endangered species. And more than that, once the imminent threat determination is made, the, the competent minister must make the recommendation to the federal cabinet. So determining that there's an imminent threat has some procedural consequences, which are uh, quite powerful in the federal system. So having made that imminent threat determination, uh, the chiefs and ministers met in Victoria. And that's a photo of Ken and I um, heading into that meeting with uh, federal and provincial ministers and deputy ministers. Um, it was a good meeting. Uh, it resulted in BC uh, recalibrating. They assigned a new team and the negotiations resumed. Um, by the fall of that year, the new draft was near completion, um, but BC got cold feet again. And around this time, unfortunately, there was a very disturbing racist backlash against the agreement. And it was fueled by a determined misinformation campaign that um, drew on the fear of uh, local people. Um, Soto sent an open letter to the communities to try and calm the waters. We asked BC to um, intervene, uh, but they uh, decided they were unable to. Um, and uh, the waters were calmed for about a month over the Christmas season, but then the uh, backlash kicked off again. At this point, I just want to sound a note of caution. The next several slides show some examples of the hate speech that was published around caribou. Um, if anyone is uh, sensitive to uh, racist um, statements, I just invite you to close your eyes for a minute. Um, I'm just going to show these slides. I'm not going to speak to them. Um, if you are a non-Indigenous person, I would like you to read these um, quickly and carefully. I think it's, uh, it's important that we identify and confront this. So here we go. I wanted to uh, show those to you and to make the point that it is actually a criminal offense to publish statements like that. And not only that, I think that this is a sickness in non-Indigenous communities, the whole length and breadth of BC. And it is up to us non-Indigenous people to 
confront this and to deal with this sickness um, in the same way that we deal with other diseases. Um, I, I also want to say that not only is the, those kinds of statements mean and ignorant, but they're also stupid and they lead to terrible, those kinds of attitudes lead to terrible land use management decisions. The other thing about statements like that is they don't really work. I mean, they, all it did was um, show BC uh, that the opposition to these agreements had no foundation, um, no credible basis. And so in January, the chiefs and deputies met again and BC committed to completing the draft. So in February of 2019, there was a, some further joint technical analysis with experts, and then the agreement was initialed, and then it went out to public engagement. Uh, some of you may have attended meetings like this, and there were community forums across BC. Um, unfortunately, the... Uh, misinformation campaign and the uh, uh, racist conspiracy theories caused a, a lot of controversy. And um, these meetings were uh, tense and um, difficult. In, uh, in April of 2019, the chiefs and ministers met and they agreed to extend the public consultation period by two weeks to help uh, the ostensibly to help get the true information out to people. Um, the premier actually announced a four week extension and appointed Blair Lectrum, who's a local politician as a community liaison. Uh, they had a, uh, a press conference to make these announcements. Um, and the community engagement process continued, uh, unfortunately, continued to be fueled by misinformation and fear and racism. And um, we did try to refocus the public conversation on what was really at stake. Uh, the, uh, conserving caribou and doing it in a way that uh, also recognized the importance of local economies, but it's hard to um, it's hard to counter uh, a really determined misinformation campaign that relies on social media. In any case, in June, uh, Mr. Lexham released his report. It made twenty recommendations many of which were already completed. I also want to note that he misspelled reconciliation throughout his report. In August, uh, BC and Canada appointed two new liaisons, but no further progress was made. And then in November, BC hosted a leadership table with um, captains of industry and local mayors. Um, but again, no process, no uh, progress was really made. Um, and uh, the uh, local governments weren't particularly keen on denouncing the racism or correcting the misinformation. It had become a political football for them. But this again, just exposed to the province that there was not a genuine foundation for opposition to the agreement. So in January, BC and Soto agreed to highlight some positive roles for local government in the agreement and to add a new anti-racism initiative to the, uh, to the agreement. And in February, <clears throat> the agreement was signed by all governments and uh, the signing ceremony was um, very moving. It was a great relief. I'm just going to share some photos for you uh, to hopefully pick up your spirits. There was about 150 people there. Um, 
four ministers and the parliamentary secretary for forests. Uh, opening comments by Chief Wayne Sparrow of Musqueam. Uh, very moving speeches from Ken and Chief Wilson from West Moberly, from the Federal Minister of Environment, and from provincial ministers. And then the uh, gentlemen sat down and got, got down to the signing. That's Minister Wilkinson, Minister Donaldson and Minister Ralston. That's Minister Heyman with his, the uh, sage bundle that was a gift to the ministers from the chiefs. And uh, Chief Wilson made a point of dedicating the agreement to the future generations. And that is Naomi's mom and Naomi's baby, Spencer. And uh, that pretty much brought 150 people to tears. It was uh, really meaningful and moving uh, signing ceremony. It takes a lot of committed people to put one of these uh, agreements together. This is, I just wanna honor the federal team who worked very hard to uh, bring this home and the provincial team, uh, that's me on the right, photo bombing with the provincial team. And also representatives from the NGOs who um, were uh, also very important in um, providing support, lifting our spirits, organizing, um, public support and uh, uh, otherwise uh, being um, an important part of the team. And uh, it was a great day. Um, and following that day, there was a, an outpouring of support on, uh, these are some examples of the Twitter posts from NGOs, uh, environmental science, human rights, um, some more posts from some of the supporting NGOs. Uh, there was tweets from uh, provincial representatives from the NDP, from the Green Party, and even the Prime Minister chipped in with uh, a tweet from Mr. Trudeau. In addition, the local chambers of commerce uh, and other local organizations kind of started to come around. So here's the three chambers of commerce from the South Peace with their press release, acknowledging the historic signing and calling on local leaders to create an environment where cultural values of First Nations are, are respected. That is a rare and beautiful statement from Chambers of Commerce in Northeast BC. And uh, I think it's an evidence of the, the way that this kind of initiative can um, ultimately uh, bring people together in, uh, in partnerships for conservation. This is the press release from the uh, mayor of the district of Tumblr. And this was the press release from the Peace River Regional District, part of the press release um, showing appreciation for the integrity and leadership shown by Soto and West Moberly throughout the process and declaring that there's no place in today's society for racism. Um, so I think it's a happy ending. Um, we can have conservation and a vibrant economy. Um, and we can protect sacred places. 
and we can recover caribou. I just want to close by saying that we never had a moment's doubt about uh, the success of this program and what we were doing. Ken knew that the creator had decided that Twin Sisters would be a sanctuary and a sacred place. Naomi knew that Soto had the technical, logistical and traditional knowledge required to recover caribou. And I knew that we had the law on our side and that we had the support of government and non-governmental organizations. And I think all of us together, very glad to be here with you today. And we are deeply optimistic about the future um, in Northeast BC and in Canada and around the world. And we're uh, looking forward to the future here. And uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, James. Um, <laughs> you managed to make me cry twice. <laughs> Uh, first, uh, first, uh, I think in in anger, and uh, and then just remembering how wonderful it was to be in that room for the signing, um, and be the one year anniversary of that signing um, coming up this Sunday, um, February twenty first. So that's that's partly why we're um, why we chose today is as a time to uh, to bring these wonderful speakers um, to you all, and just seeing lots and lots of of thanks. Uh, in the chat box, uh, as well as um, you know, of course, some you know shock and anger, and in some cases, not so much anger um, from people who are are well aware and have experienced themselves um, racism in their own communities. Um, and I want to actually uh, maybe maybe go to a question from Dwayne Janvier, who asks, "How does the agreement stand legally against regime changes, and does it diminish?" inherent native rights at all. Our elders tell us never to make agreements with the province. Uh, I always wanna offer Ken and Naomi the chance to answer um, first. Uh, Ken and Naomi, do you have any, any doubts about um, the agreements or anything along the lines of the question? Yeah, I think I think you'd be well qualified to answer that because it it it, it talks about the legal aspect of the of the agreement. We just want to save caribou. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just say, um, you know, agreements have been made between indigenous people and non it, between indigenous people and indigenous people um, in history, and they've been made between. Indigenous and non-Indigenous people um, in the history of Canada as well. And um, so uh, my first point, I think, is that agreements are, um, can be a good thing. Um, unfortunately, it, agreements work best when people live up to them. <laughs> and uh, uh, agreements made by the um, by the Crown um, in BC and in Canada, don't the, there's not the best history of uh, the Crown living up to its side of the of the agreement. So I understand the um, hesitancy and the um, caution um, about making agreements with governments. Um, on the other hand. Uh, this is a new era where um, Indigenous rights are on the rise in a good way and have been um, recognized and affirmed in the Constitution. And I think um, in, if you look at the recent history in the past, um, 25 or 30 years, there's been a lot of progress made and a lot of positive changes. Now it's not perfect and there's still a lot of work to do in, in terms of attitudes and um, 
but uh, there's, I, I'm optimistic about it. This particular agreement, um, I'd invite you to read it. It's on the internet. Um, it's, uh, there's a bunch of lawyers' uh, words in there and it's um, a little complicated in spots, but uh, it really pays honor to um, Soto and Westmo. And uh, it recognizes the achievements they've made in caribou recovery and it promises to support them. And um, so I think there is a way forward with agreements and there's a, there's a way forward for, uh, for indigenous governments and, and non-indigenous governments. And part of that is through agreements. I just wanted to add like caribou are such an iconic species for Canada. So it only makes sense to invite all the people we can and having the federal and provincial government support our endeavors. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. Thank you. Um, it, it really is, I loved it when you put up the chart that showed, you know, how big this protected area will be, you know, as opposed, compared to Tweedsmere and others. And, and I feel like this is the biggest conservation achievement in the province since the Great Bear Rainforest. And certainly that's the way people were talking about it at, that, um, at the signing ceremony a year ago. And it's just such an incredible gift to, to, the, to Earth and to all of us that, that what, you've, what you've done and what you're doing here. So I'm seeing just so much gratitude in the chat box and we will save that file because it's really quite wonderful to read a lot of the very heartfelt um, heartfelt statements that are that are coming there. There's a question. Um, there's quite a few questions. We won't get to all of them, um, but I wanted to. Uh, there's a question from Bonnie who's asking about um, would a Species at Risk Act for the province be helpful um, for for this uh, for your initiatives or or more broadly. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that first for, and lay some, something down for Ken and Naomi to respond to. I think, um, there's been talk about having a provincial species at risk act and, you know, generally speaking, I think that that's, uh, a good thing, but the devil's in the details, right? I mean, it depends on what it says and what it doesn't say. Um, I think that there's a concern in the provincial government about, um, you know, the the balance between conservation and uh, economic development, and so I I assume that's what's holding them up. Um, but you know, I think per, basically as a citizen of BC, I think that they should they should do it, and they should uh, make it effective. In the meantime. Um, the Species at Risk Act, which is federal legislation, uh, which Canada administers, it is a powerful tool for um, achieving the right balance. And I, I just encourage all our friends from the um, federal government on the uh, joining us today that to to be proud of that and to um, to use it because uh, it's there to be used. But yeah. It, it would be a good thing and it would be a good thing to have a lot of indigenous um, participation in the development of that. Uh, I think it's uh, part of the Crown's duty to protect indigenous resources, whether it's under treaty or under Aboriginal rights. And it's, uh, it, would, it could be a good tool to achieve a good balance between conservation and uh, and uh, the economy. And just to note that Tim has posted a link to the um, to the partnership agreement itself, and we will also post that on the ethical page, ethical space site on uh, the Y two Y website. And you'll be getting uh, links. You'll be hearing from us. I wanted to um, uh, to offer the the floor back to to Ken and Naomi for some uh, sort of last thoughts as we as we wrap up today. Uh, anything more that you would like to say to our guests? Well, I'll start off with just a short little statement saying that uh, 
we were doing this for, you know, for the, obviously for the four leggeds we were trying to save where we are saving and we're doing it for the future generations that even the ones that are yet to come. And uh, we want to be able to be proud of, of what we've started and what, what we're achieving here. And we, I think it, it needs to be, you know, for, for myself personally, because I come from the traditional teaching and the old way, I've always had no doubt that this was going to work. I've always said there's something more powerful than us that's that's happening here that's helping us. So my belief has always been there in the, in that way of thinking. So I've never had any doubts ever of of that this was going to work or not. So yeah, that's all I have to say. Naomi. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> I just want to thanks everyone for joining our presentation today. It was, and I want to thank Y to Y for setting this up for us. Um, it was really a great experience, and thank you. I just love sharing our story. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much um, to all um, presenters. That was just really wonderful, and I'm I'm so glad we recorded it. <laughs> And, uh, and that'll be up on our website soon. I also want to thank the Vancouver Foundation, which is sponsoring the Ethical Space Series. Um, if you had a question that didn't get answered, and I see that many of you do, um, we're going to put Tim's email. Tim is going to put his email in the chat, and he would be happy to either answer or get you an answer. Tim's been working um, with, uh, with Soto First Nations for several years in the piece. And uh, so he's, he's got just some knowledge on his own and, and he can also, um, you know, go to the presenters for more. Um, so we will be sending you out a link to an evaluation for today's session. It'll just take you a few minutes and it really helps us um, to keep organizing these sessions. We want to keep doing this work. Um, it's, it's important to us. And uh, it also helps us know um, what else um, people might be interested in. And so I would inc encourage you also to uh, save the date. We will send you a little save the date um, reminder, but uh, one month from today, four weeks from today on March 17th, also at 10 o'clock Pacific, uh, we will be um, having a session with Michelle Sam. And Michelle Sam is a Tanaha Aksmakinik. <laughs> it means a Tanaha human being. And uh, she is a, a 60 scoop kid and uh, five generations ahead of her attended St. Eugene's Mission School. So she uh, situates her self-development as an act of freedom from, from those histories. She has a MSW in social work, uh, degrees in English literature and indigenous learning. Really, really interesting woman. And she, her plan is to take you on an intellectual journey and lead you through a pragmatic attempt at reconciliation. So this will be a very hands-on session. Um, there's going to be several breakouts in there and it'll be a, a chance for folks to roll up their sleeves a little bit um, with, under Michelle's guidance. So we will be sending you an invitation to that and the registration link will be posted as well, probably, uh, probably before the end of the week, but for now just save that date. Um, yeah, check out the resources on our website. We have a, a reading list. We have the previous uh, sessions recorded and that's it from us. Thank you again so much uh, to our presenters Thank you. and uh, to all of you for being here. Have a beautiful day and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.